Hey Canucks fans, today the Draeger Cafe becomes the Clayton Cafe. I'm Clay Emo, I'm at Clay on Twitter, I'm at Clayton Emo on Instagram, I'm the founder of the GLCPC, the Good Looking Canucks Positivity Club, and this is my Canucks take, all in one take. It's Clay's Canucks commentary for Tuesday, June the 2nd. This is where you get Canucks insight that's positive and timely. Thrilled to continue my Zoom chats today with TSN analyst, TSN insider, Darren Dreger. Dregs was awesome. This was a very quick interview, about 25 minutes, but we hit on a lot of things. Return to play, all the unrest that's happening in the States, Gary Bettman, the Vancouver Canucks, Calder Trophy, whatever it may be. So I, I just can't wait for you guys to watch this because uh, Darren shows how thoughtful he is. He shows how smart he is, how, how, uh, you know, how well versed he is. And um, I, I know you won't be disappointed. So enjoy this chat with TSN analyst and insider, Darren Drager. Hey friends, so excited about my guest today. And in, in honor of him, I'm gonna call this the Clayton Cafe instead of the Drager Cafe. This is from TSN National Media, the champ, Darren Drager. Darren, thanks for coming on today. My pleasure, thanks for having me. No, no problem. I know you got a busy day, so we'll get right to it. I'm a very loyal listener and viewer of your podcast. So uh, congratulations on the house purchase. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's an ongoing development to be sure. Um, the, the, the factual side of that statement is there has been a house purchased, um, but we're in the process of selling our house. So, you know, I don't know who does this in the midst of a pandemic, but I guess it would be me. That's who does it. Me, my family. So yes. uh, it's been a chaotic experience, uh, but as they say, life goes on and uh, that's what we're dealing with right now. Well, you know who does it is a very confident man does that, I think, during this time. <laughs> and a supportive <laughs> family, for sure. There you go. And you mentioned your family, a wife and a couple of kids. Is that correct? Yeah, I've got a 21-year-old yeah. daughter uh, who's awesome. hoping to attend fourth-year university at Ryerson in Toronto this fall. And I've got an almost 19-year-old son who uh, is preparing for his second year at Guelph University. But there's a lot of uncertainty there, Clay, as you know as well, yeah. with uh, you know whether or not these uh, young people will be able to uh, go to class. It seems unlikely. In fact, both those universities are offering up online courses for the first term. So uh, yeah. it's going to be a challenge, but at least they have the opportunity to uh, further their higher learning by doing so online. No, I hear you. My eldest son, Sean, is the same age as your uh, youngest son. So he's going to second, uh, second year UBC, and exact same thing. They've already said everything's yeah. online and be prepared for it. And my wife's a teacher, so she's right in the middle of it too. It's, it's quite crazy, right. yeah. Okay, well, let's get to, obviously, a lot of unrest going on, especially in the States, given everything that happened last week. And I just, uh, just one quick question. You started to see more hockey players, obviously all the teams stepping up, releasing statements, and, and really um, some really good heartfelt statements. And it's something that players usually aren't known for, unless it's a really, really extraordinary circumstance. Do you, two questions, Darren. Do you think they have a responsibility to do so? And do, we, do you think you'll, we'll see more of this? going forward? Well, I think we all have a responsibility to be fair to do what's right. And whether it's social media or it's, it's just, you know, every day and, and how we live our lives and how we treat people most importantly. Um, so I don't think that some of the NHL players and the NHL stars who have reached out and uh, shared their positive messages via social media are being encouraged by anyone. Mm -hmm. I think that this comes within the heart and soul and the character of these individual players. Um, and, and yeah, they can have some level of impact, no doubt about that. I mean, you know, we're all hockey fans to some degree. So, you know, when you see something as impactful as was posted on Jonathan Tave's social media channels, I mean, yeah. it, it hits home. And you're like, good for you, Jonathan, <laughs> because you're using your powerful platform to better the planet. And you can't ask for anything more out of any human being than that. Share your positivity and, and let the world know that you stand behind equality and what's right. And, and, you know, his message was shared by hundreds of thousands, if not millions by now. I don't know. I haven't checked the number of retweets and reposts and, and all of that. Uh, but I've been really impressed by, again, the number of athletes who are voicing both their concern and, and their support. And in the NHL, it's, it's a wide margin. You know, you had Blake Wheeler of the Winnipeg Jets speak out, John Tavares of the Toronto Maple Leafs, Evander Kane has been a champion of the cause, clearly. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Akeem Aliou uh, essentially has been fighting the fight uh, most of his entire life, I would say. 
uh, but he's been very active, you know, not just recently either, but, yeah. you know, dating back over the past several months and, and using, you know, his building platform uh, for, again, the greater good. You know, I will tell you this, and, and it has nothing to do with the current environment or the political position or human rights in general of where we're at today. Uh, but at a recent NHL general managers meeting, the most recent, they brought in a, a social media expert. And mm -hmm. this expert encouraged the general managers to go back to their clubs and do what they could do to, to create a, a bigger social media platform. Now, it was probably more from a, a marketing sense. Who's kidding who? You know, building a <laughs> brand, if you will. But many of the general managers came out of that meeting and said, wow, you know, we had no idea. I mean, you know, there's some concern when you see your players on social media because normally they're responding to a negative comment on how they played or maybe they're engaging with fans and they probably shouldn't be because it, it sparks negativity. So I don't think then we could expect what we're seeing now. But I fully applaud the voice that pro athletes uh, are using um, because the world needs more positive influence, especially right now. Well, well said, Darren. I could actually end this vlog right here and that'll, that'll be enough for me. That was really, really good. Thank you. Yeah, that Jonathan Tay's video, it, it's almost it's beautiful in a symmetric, uh, symmetry. The 46-year-old, the 31-year-old, the 16-year-old, and, and just the dichotomy of the two people um, yeah, really, really pouring out their hearts. It was tough to watch, but it was a, you know, his words were absolutely beautiful. Yeah, it, it was. And just to interject on that, what struck yeah. me, and, and you and I have already disclosed, I mean, we, we've got parents of teenagers, um, and <clears throat> I'm, I'm looking at the eyes of the 16-year-old boy yeah. uh, who's in the middle of all of, the, all of this, and, and it felt like and it looked like he was really being impacted by the messaging from the 31 year old man who clearly was very emotional and saying, this isn't working. The way we've been doing this, the fight that we've been fighting, it isn't working the way we're doing it. We've got to find a better way. And it looked to me again, without knowing any of these men, but that 16 year old looked like he was deeply and emotionally impacted. So if there's going to be change, it, it, it has to come at that level and younger, right? Yeah. So. I know my son was uh, emotionally um, influenced by it. And here's hoping that everyone else who watched it, the younger generation, our generation, and the older generation were equally moved by it. Well said, Darren. Yeah, you just see him. He was trying to stand tall and be brave, but you could tell that he was, yeah. he was hurting inside. Well put. All right, let's move on. Your last chat was with uh, Gary Bettman for your podcast. And um, I have a quick story about him after, but um, he came across to me as very dare I say, likable. And you know what Vancouver fans think of Gary Bettman. And he seemed very honest, very transparent. He admitted when he didn't know the answer. What was your biggest takeaway from your chat with Gary Bettman? Well, just how, how transparent and honest he was and comfortable he was. And, yeah. I, you know, I guess it's easier to be comfortable when you're working within the confines of your home. Uh, <laughs> you know, self-isolation has been a challenge for all of us. I'm not complaining. It's, it's just the reality of the life that we have to live in the world of COVID-19. Um, but, you know, as comfortable as I am having this conversation with you, um, I got that same feeling from Commissioner Bettman. And I, mm. you know, I've known Gary Bettman for a number of, of years, decades, in fact. Um, and, and because of some of the events that I've covered or I've attended, I've had an opportunity, like All-Star Weekends as an exa example, Clay, of seeing Commissioner Bettman in a family environment with his grandchildren, with his children. Uh, with his wife. And so in seeing him being as, as open and as comfortable as he was in that setting, wasn't a surprise to me. And, and then you go back, what was it, two weeks ago when he made the, the format presentation <laughs> confirming the 2014 field. And, you know, then he did some post-media availability after that. And you could hear his three-year-old grandson banging pots and hooting <laughs> and hollering in the background. It just adds a human element to a commissioner who normally comes across as business first, no matter what. Trust me when I tell you this, he's as competitive as any human being on this planet. He wants to win no matter what. He wants to represent his owners um, and, and all associated with the National Hockey League to whatever capability that he is, is able to. Um, so there's that side of Gary Bettman. <laughs> But it's refreshing to, to see him as a grandfather 
uh, and as a comfortable person in that environment, talking about some pretty serious stuff. And, and also being very honest and acknowledging he doesn't have the answers. He doesn't know what the end result is of this is going to be. You know, he can strategize with his team of, of medical advisors and the staff that works closely with him at the NHL and work arm in arm with the NHL Players Association and the provincial and the state and the federal governments and all of that. But in the end, he doesn't have the answers. They're planning, they're ready for when they get the all clear. So that's why I feel like he's most comfortable being as open and as sharing as he has been to this point. Oh, it's, Darren, that's awesome. It's funny you mentioned the All-Star game. I was actually going to say, I was there in San Jose. That's the only one I've been blessed to go to. And I actually met him at one of the after parties. And I, I basically said, hi, nice to meet you. I'm Clay uh, from Vancouver. Looking forward to having the draft in Vancouver in six months. And then I actually took a picture with him. And I was embarrassed, man. He's taller than me. He's taller than me. <laughs> and so I, I posted all my friends were ragging on me. But I, my theory is he's always standing next to hockey players who are on state. So that's why he looks so short. But I don't know all that. But you're... Yeah. you're he, he, he is a good guy. You remember, of course, um, and, and I'm not a tall man. I'm, you know, on a good day, I'm five foot nine and a half. So, okay, okay. Uh, but, but there was something not amusing, but somewhat jarring. I remember as a young reporter, I, I, I believe I was doing an Ottawa Senators game way back in the day, ho hosting, when Zdeno Chera was traded to the Ottawa Senators. Oh, no. And so during the um, first intermission, I was to, to interview Zdeno Chera. Well, I mean, the man is six foot nine wearing flip flops. So you put skates on him and, and seven you know, feet. <laughs> he's six eleven pushing seven feet. And so when the Boston Bruins won the Stanley Cup, you know, and, and Commissioner Bettman, you know, was there with the Stanley Cup besides Zdeno Chara, you know, you're looking going, oh boy. I mean, it was less about the difference in height, which is abundantly obvious, and less about how short Commissioner Bettman is and more about how mammoth a human being that G Zidane Chera actually is. That is awesome. Uh, blessed to be season ticket holder. So I was actually at that game, and we weren't sure who we were booing more, Gary Bettman or Zidane Chara. <laughs> yeah, now. no kidding. Well, <laughs> I understand. I understand. As a Canucks fan, I get it. <laughs> we'll call it a tie. Um, Return to the play plan. You mentioned that uh, we, they released details last week. And I want to ask you, Darren, of the four things that stand out to me, which one intrigued you the most? Is it the, the qualifying round or the play-in? Is it the fact that the, other, the top eight teams for each conference are going to have to play each other in the round robin? Is it this whole bracket versus receiving debate? Or is it this, uh, this two part, two groups of teams, three lottery draw? Is it the draft lottery? Which of those four really intrigued you the most? Well, the draft lottery does not intrigue me. <laughs> Um, I mean, I wasn't very good at calculus back in the day. And this to me is, is like solving a calculus problem. And I, right. I appreciate the complexity of it all uh, because of the nuance of, of, you know, everything from a conditional draft pick and, and, and yeah. how you define, uh, not how you define point percentage, but, you know, just making it fair for everybody and, and how difficult that can be. So um, I guess I'll be more interested when we get closer <laughs> Sure. The first drop later this month. Um, I, I, I am intrigued by the whole competitive aspect of, of what the 24 team field looks like. And so if you start with the qualifying round, we know that the hockey isn't going to be crisp. You know, these players aren't going to be as sharp <laughs> as they would be, you know, going into round one of a traditional Stanley Cup playoff because, you know, they, they've essentially played for the better part of 10 months. Um, but the intensity is going to be there. The emotional investment is going to be there because, and, and not to be dramatic, but some of these teams are literally playing for their playoff lives. You know, it's a play in that qualifying round. So it's going to be intense. And, and so I'm interested to see comparatively what that looks like when you compare it to the teams who are, who are in the round robin, the top four teams in the West and the top four teams in the Eastern conferences. Um, because is the intensity level going to be as intense? You know that you're advancing, you know, right. but in essence, we believe that you're going to be playing for a seeding. Now, uh, we've got insider trading coming up uh, later today. This is Tuesday and again on Thursday. And I, I believe that we're going to have answers to some of the questions that are still out there. You know, will it be a bracket formula? Will it be a, a seeding formula? Uh, I think that the NHL would prefer the bracket formula in the Stanley Cup playoffs, the field of 16, 
because it, it might help sell better television. It might provide better fan enhancement, but is it more fair to go through round one and then reseed um, just based on, you know, where teams finished and, and who they might match up against. And I feel that the Players Association believe that it's more fair to reseed round after round. But we'll have answers, you know, at some point, maybe as early as today being Tuesday uh, or, or tomorrow. So I don't know if I've answered any of your questions. <laughs> I'm long-winded here. But everything outside of the draft lottery includes <laughs> No, that's awesome. And they're all connected, obviously. And yeah. you're right, as you and Ray mentioned on your on your podcast. Yeah, it's a huge difference because there's a difference between a 12 team winning and playing against a, a four seed as opposed to a number yeah. one seed. That's a huge difference if they don't reseed. Absolutely. No, yeah, no question. Okay, this is the one I need the most help on. And I think a lot of uh, hockey fans overall, if you could take two or three minutes, take as long as you need to explain to me, what is escrow and what the, what's happening now? How could that affect it? Well, I won't need two to three minutes. Uh, oh, awesome. I, I shouldn't. And if I do, <laughs> then you can virtually throat punch me. Um, <laughs> okay. I'm ready. Yeah. So, so just to give you a basic collective bargaining agreement tune up here, um, the, the, the salary cap system is based on 50-50 uh, between the players and the owners. Um, but it is the burden of the players to make that system whole at 50-50. So traditionally speaking, this year as an example, uh, the players paid a 14% escrow. So on top of the, the tax and in Canada and in some states in the U.S., taxes are incredibly tough. We all know that as Canadian citizens. Who likes paying taxes? None of us. Um, so I, I'm, I'm always careful to be critical of NHL players and the money they make because it's all relative. And, and so... If you take a million dollar salary, which is on the lower end, obviously, but let's take a million dollar salary. If you're living in Vancouver or you're living in Toronto or most provinces in Canada, automatically you're getting lopped off upwards of 53%. That automatically comes off. Uh, so now a million is less than 500,000. On top of that, you've got that percentage of escrow that you have to pay in check by check. Um, and again, Normally, it's around 14%. It's been higher. So that 14% then comes off. Uh, so now you're making uh, less than, well... Yeah, 350, 400. Yeah, three Exactly. Yeah. Uh, then you've got to pay your uh, representation, your player agent. And there are other costs that come off of that. And then you've got your living expenses. You know, these guys buy homes. They rent houses. Um, they drive nice cars. Uh, and and they, they've got some living expenses that all have to be factored in. So keep that all in mind when you're being critical of the money that these players make. Now, you know, when you look at Connor McDavid or Austin Matthews or um, any of the big Mitch Meyer, a, a big money earner, okay, these guys are doing fine. They're doing <laughs> fine. Their children are going to be fine. Their children's children are going to be <laughs> fine. Um, but all that matters. So what we don't know, Clay, at this point is what's the escrow and what's the repair work <clears throat> that needs to be done moving forward? Because we know, excuse me here for a moment. No problem. Got a dry throat. That's all right. I um, had you talking for the last 20 minutes. Yeah, well, the last, <laughs> I don't know how many <laughs> weeks. Um, what we don't know is, is how the lost revenue uh, north of a billion dollars this season is, is, is going to be recuperated. How can you possibly know that? What we know is it can happen in one season. It's probably going to take years of repair. So there has to be a partnership between the owners and the players to make that fair. You know, if it were on the players, and now I'm getting to that two, three minute mark. It's all right, uh, it's worth it. <laughs> the, the players in the current system would pay better than a 30% escrow. Well, that, that's, that's not doable. That's, that, that can't happen. So there's going to have to be a negotiation between the NHL and the Players Association that creates a repair formula that doesn't just manage this year. It manages next year, the year after, the year after, maybe a five-year plan, you know, so that it is more palatable for the players. And there is a partnership in that. And, and so the salary cap, you know, based on today's revenue and the lost revenue, obviously would drop if you read the language of the existing CBA 
there will be a negotiated salary cap and it'll probably be a, a, be a, fat cap, a flat cap that's around what it is right now. Mm -hmm. So none of that they know. But if there isn't an agreement, a negotiation that works for both sides, then get ready because there is going to be a nasty battle between the NHL and the PA if they can't come to terms on what the repair future looks like. Awesome. That is very helpful. Thank you, Darren. I appreciate that. Let's end off by talking a few, uh, very few uh, Canucks questions because I know uh, most of my viewers are from Vancouver. They'd love yeah. to hear your thoughts. Uh, handicap quickly the series between Vancouver and the Minnesota Wild. It's going to be a tough one. Um, you know, there was something about the Minnesota Wild that developed over the course of the season. I mean, they obviously went through their pitfalls, um, you know, ended up in, in Bruce Boudreaux losing his job. Mm. Uh, you know, obviously Billy Guerin, general manager, uh, had to make some, some difficult decisions. For the most part, that's a veteran club, and they are going to be a challenge. Um, they've gotten healthy. The Vancouver Canucks are, for the most part, healthy. So this time off is going to be interesting to see how that manifests, again, with players who may have had issues uh, going into a normal pay playoff here. Now, relatively speaking, most players are in good health and, and should be raring to go. Uh, Goaltending for both sides should be fine. Uh, defensively, again, both sides look pretty good. You know, it's the front end offensive talent of the Vancouver Canucks for me that is, is likely going to be a tipping point. It's not like Minnesota doesn't have, you know, uh, high-end talented players. Of course they do. No question about that. But, you know, if, if Vancouver can play – um, that type of style with a, a, a decent defensive responsibility and, and manage that and balance that with the high octane offense that they can throw at you, then I, I like the chances of, of the Vancouver Canucks. I believe that that qualifying round is going to be a best of five. And Clay, mm -hmm. um, that's a dangerous situation. <laughs> Scary, man. So, so when you say handicap it, I, I'm going to wimp out and say, I, I don't know. I, I I could give you 50-50 because so much happens in game six. And then obviously game seven is, is a game changer. And you can throw out all the theories yeah. and all the experience and, and all the analysis of why team X should be team Y in a best in, in a game seven winner take all formula. But game five is different than game seven. So uh, a five game series is going to be interesting. It would be, I, I think because of the experience, it, it would do the Vancouver Canucks well to win the first game of that best of five. I agree with you. And a great point, though, about the – everyone in Vancouver is excited about the, the matchup of our offense because we got Besser back. And yeah. finally we had our top six as we wanted to, and then we got one game out of it before everything shut down. So yeah. <laughs> we'll see how that happens. One other Canucks question. Um, I presume you are a voter when it comes to the NHL awards. I am, yeah. Okay. Uh, and have you voted yet? I understand no, not yet. No. Okay, I, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna make you say who you're gonna vote for for the Calder. But if you were gonna vote for Quinn Hughes, if you were, um, build the case for him. Uh, why would you vote for Quinn Hughes? Well, starting with hockey IQ. Uh, I mean, this young man is incredibly talented in that regard. His hockey sense, as we like to talk about, in the hockey world, is 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 off the charts. And when you combine that with a, a fearless approach and elite level skill set. That, that makes for a dangerous player. Um, you know, and, and when I say no fear, he recognizes that he can go more often than the, the more traditional offensive-minded defenseman, right? Um, he can read plays where, you know, he can see things that he believes are about to happen. And if he makes a mistake, he's quick enough, he's mobile enough that he can get back and, and, and he can fix the mistake that he just made. And how many times did you see that <laughs> over the course of the year with, uh, with, with Quinn Hughes? Um, so it's, it's not difficult to build a case for Quinn Hughes to, to be a, a, a top candidate and right there with Kale McCarr in terms of, of winning the Rookie of the Year award. Um, Kale McCarr, though, takes us back to last season, right? Mm -hmm. He signed in April with the Colorado Avalanche. He jumps in and man, he was good. <laughs> he was shockingly good immediately. And I think many of us thought, okay, well, you know, that's adrenaline. That's your first taste of the National Hockey League. You know, they're giving him an opportunity to succeed in the playoffs. Let's see if he can sustain that game by game 
you know, in, in, in the regular season when play gets underway in 1920. And he did. And yeah. he, there, there, there was no fallback. There was just further growth in, in development. And all the things that I said about Quinn Hughes apply to, to, to Kale McCarr. So I, I feel like Kale McCarr still has the edge. Mm -hmm. But everything I know about Quinn Hughes from a hockey perspective is, is right there. And on top of that, and, and this is full disclosure for you, I know Quinn. I, I know Jack. I know the Hughes family. I've known them for years, long before these, these young men were, were making their way in the National Hockey League. Um, you know, my son used to play against Jack in, in minor hockey, and mm. they trained together here in, here in Ontario uh, going up through the years as well. Uh, so it's going to be a difficult decision when I've literally got to go, okay, <laughs> Kale is, um, you know, better ahead for this reason, this reason, and this reason versus Quinn Hughes. As I answer this today, I can't give you uh, an answer as to who I'm going to go with. Well, Darren, you build a compelling case for both players, but I can speak for all of Vancouver Canucks fans when I say you know what to do. Okay, <laughs> lastly, lastly, uh, last two minutes, and then I'll let you get going. Uh, rapid answer. This is what I call my six-pack. That's how I wind up all my vlogs. You can expand as little as you want uh, okay. or as, as briefly as you want. Number one, are you an extrovert or are you an introvert? Uh, I'd be an extrovert. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I have no problem, you know, dispensing opinion, battling engaging with strangers that sort of thing so i'm an extrovert awesome number two and very uh, appropriate given what we just talked about who is more important to the canucks future in your eyes elias Pettersson or quinn hughes if you can only pick one use whatever definition of important you want i mean that's ridiculous <laughs> wow i mean they're both cornerstone pieces yeah. uh, <clears throat> um generational players uh, I would say that Patterson probably fits more into that description of mm -hmm. being a, a generational player and not too many teams have that, but not too many players have Quinn or teams have Quinn Hughes either. But again, if we're splitting hairs, I'll say Patterson. Appreciate the answer. Netflix or Disney plus. Uh, I don't watch a lot of either, but mm -hmm. I'll, I'll go with Netflix just because when we're forced into self isolation, like everybody else, I binge watched all of the series on uh, <laughs> mostly on Netflix. Your kids are a little older too. They're 21 and 19, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, there you go. Number four, if you could only go out to dinner with one of these three people, they are paying so you don't have to cover the bill. Francesco Aquilini, Jim Benning, or Travis Green? <laughs> uh, well, with all due respect to all, I, I've, I've shared a glass of wine with Francesco Aquilini, so I feel like I, not to dismiss him, but I can push that aside. Yeah. Um, I know Jim Benning pretty well. I've had lots of conversations, obviously, with Jim, as I have with, with Travis Green. But given the fact that I, I, I know Travis as a player, I interviewed him so many times, I know him as a coach, and I've got a deep level of respect for – I mean, Ray Ferraro and I have talked about this on the podcast as well. I mean – and, and this is no disrespect to Travis, but Ray and other teammates of Travis Green are incredibly surprised at the fact that he's an NHL head coach, given the guy they knew when he was an NHL player. Not only an NHL head coach, but a proven NHL head coach and a coach who's, who's come up through the ranks. So I know Travis would have some great tales about Ray and about uh, a lot of other good buddies of mine. So he might be more entertaining in terms of the storytelling awesome last two and you won't offend me either way because i'm half of each japanese food or chinese food uh i, I seem to eat more chinese food because my family um has been exposed to more chinese food i like japanese food but i would say given longevity and and uh <laughs> frequency I, i'd side with chinese food awesome and lastly here's the ultimate question who is the insider of insiders? Is it Darren Drager, Bob McKenzie, or Pierre Lebrun? Uh, not even a, it, it's not even a fair fight, Clay. It's, it's Bob McKenzie. And, I, and, and you know, I joke, um, but I'm not sitting here. We're not having this conversation probably without Bob McKenzie. I, I likely don't leave Sportsnet in 2006 to join TSN without Bob McKenzie. I probably don't 
become an insider without Bob McKenzie being the pioneer. And, and I, you know, I, I, I share that with everyone. Um, there's perhaps no pair LeBron in, 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 in the circle of insiders, myself, Elliot Friedman, Chris Johnson, go down the list. Bob McKenzie is the Bob father. <laughs> um, and he is the pioneer when it comes to NHL insiders. Awesome. Darren, thank you. I know you're going back to back to back today, so I really appreciate the time that you took to speak to me and to the people that will be watching this vlog. So take care of yourself and stay safe, stay healthy, and take care of your family. Thanks again. My pleasure. Be well. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. I know I did, and I really appreciate Dar Darren fitting me in today. He had a lot of meetings, a lot of recordings, a lot of media to do today but we were able to, um, to meet earlier this morning and I'm so grateful that he made the time. So what stood out to you from what he said? We started talking about um, everything going on in the States and the protests and he, he mentioned Jonathan Taves as well as other players. Maybe that stood out to you. We also talked about Gary Bettman and we talked about the return to play and he's really you know, not so excited about uh, the draft lottery as you saw, but he is excited about the qualifying round and the potential of reseeding. We talked about escrow, that helped me a lot. I have no clue what that, uh, what that meant before and now I do. And of course we talked about the Vancouver Canucks. It sounds like he's leaning towards Kale McCarr, but I think we can try and convince him to go otherwise. Regardless, um, I really hope you enjoyed that chat. Leave a comment below in, in, and I'd love to read React and Reply. Tell me what stood out to you from that chat with Darren Drager. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, take care of yourselves, take care of each other. Have a great day, God bless, and go Canesco.